Hey, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday. This is Cherie. You know, the older I get, the more I'm like, this is what I feel. This is what I see. This is where I'm at. Um, and I never like absolutes. You know, I never like saying this is exactly like I'll always be in the space that I am in right now. Um, I don't like the ironclad ideology, dogmatic, like precise black, white stuff anymore. I like just being in a space of mystery and exploration and curiosity and kind of giving myself that permission has taken me a long, long time. You know, Wendy Jensen came to me at a workshop uh, that I was doing in Arizona and she was there and we met and, and we later coached together. She came to me for coaching with business and different things. And then we kind of lost touch, stayed a little bit in touch on social media. I would watch her from afar. I saw her publish a book, which we'll talk about in the course of our discussion, but man, she just took off. And then I didn't hear or see her for a while, which I now know she went into her little dark night of the soul episode, which I did too. And we were having this simultaneous experience, although not communicating with each other, which I find is pretty common. Actually, when I reconnect with people, you kind of go through something and you kind of feel alone in it. You think you're the only one going through it. And then you find out, oh, my friend was going through this too, but we just weren't talking about it. It's been fun to see her emerge as this is who I am. This is what I have come to know. Her big thing is listening to the mind body. It was her expertise for many years. It still is, of course, but she has really taken it into more of a like how religious institutions abuse or overpower our own knowing or how they are adept at phrasing things and not necessarily controlling as much as just programming and how we buy into certain ideologies and programming that might be someone's opinion, but that aren't actually in full service to our evolvement as spiritual beings. And so there's this whole thing about how we get into patterns of giving away our power. And you guys know I'm big on that. Like I've been talking about it through literally every single episode. So sovereignty, claiming your own personal authority, stepping into your own power, finding your own voice and those kind of things. So her slant with it has been sort of her transitioning away from her religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of which we both share that same religious faith tradition. As you'll hear in our discussion, you know, I've had my own I guess you could say crash with that in terms of what do I believe and what do I know and what do I not know and, and how can I come into my own state of being and an awareness and trust myself enough to ask the deeper questions of what I actually know versus what has been handed to me. For those of you who are kind of on that path or feeling that out for yourself, it can be painful and it can be alienating and it can feel, you know, even though you know you're in an integrity and you know that you have a genuine intention around it, it can feel to some people a little bit threatening and they don't know where to take you <laughs> or how to take you or where you're going. And sometimes you don't know where you're going. You just know you're honoring your own inquisitiveness and your own inquiry process. So we are going to talk about the process of inquiry in the course of our discussion together. And we're going to talk about how questions open and expand us. And when we get into exhaustive cycles around trying to figure it out in the head, which is not where most of our innate body intelligence lies. Our innate body intelligence lies in every organ and system of our body, most especially our gut and our heart. And this is what Wendy has written her book on. It's her healing questions guide, which is, I don't know how many page, hundreds of pages it is, but she actually published that book way before she hit kind of her wall with her own truth or faith crisis. So listen with an open mind and know that our hearts are in the right space as we commiserate together and, and talk through things together and get really honest and vulnerable, which I think is the only place where healing can actually happen is when people get really real. And don't forget about my Stance Be Shine retreat that you can go to my website at the very top and register for shereeburton.com. You'll find all about it. We're um, filling up really fast and I'm getting really excited about the group of women we're gathering. They're super powerful women, women who are wanting to go to that next level in their life and get really clear on their soul voice and, and knowing how important it is to step into their soul sovereignty and power in a very gentle and welcoming and inviting way. So go to my website on that. And without further ado, let's bring on Wendy as we talk about exhaustion versus expansion. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for being a part of this discussion today. I know that whenever I start talking to you, I always feel like I'm thinking of things a different way. So I'm sure you're going to bring that to our listeners. Um, I'm excited to be here. Yay. We have a slight delay on Zoom. So I hope everybody's um, a little patient with our process here. Sometimes we get a little glitchy delay, but 
So Wendy and I met, we were just putting that together over a decade ago. And I was traveling out to Arizona to do a workshop and somehow we connected through a mutual friend and we've kind of been on like Facebook friends. And we, um, at one time, it's interesting how things come full circle because at one time I was kind of coaching you on some life coachy, business coachy stuff. And then, um, just recently I reached out to you because I know that you're doing such amazing work, helping women in different stations of their life through midlife, (laughs) which I'm definitely in. So it's fun. Um, it's fun for us to have that reciprocal relationship where we feel like we can contribute to each other's lives and, and be able to kind of show up, I guess, for each other. And it's interesting because now I'm like, I really, I had, I think I told you when I messaged you, like, I just had this knowing that you needed to be on my podcast because there was something that you could offer that um, maybe in our conversation together that could come forward that would be a new way of people looking at things. Um, So yeah, here you are. Here we are. I, I love the healing questions guide that you wrote. Um, It's a really thick book. It's very comprehensive. It really goes into a lot of depth around how there's emotional causation or emotional roots to a lot of the physical ailments we experience, which has been a huge passion of mine exploring that that's kind of made part of my career has really um, blossomed from that philosophy or that's not just a philosophy, a scientific fact that a lot of the things that show up in the body have some kind of a belief or a pattern attached to that we aren't aware of that is circulating through the body and causing disconnection, discomfort, eventually disease. So you and I share that same passion. And um, I was so thrilled when I saw your book come out because I I met you long before it came out. And I'm like, I knew you were going to do something cool. (laughs) Um, What year did your book come out? It was like three years ago or something. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It came out in 2015. So it's been about four years. And yeah, it's been, it still hasn't been edited yet. That's my goal for this year is to get it re-edited and and the cover redone and really make it what I I want it to be. But it's kind of been my little baby and my little project for quite a while now. What I find really interesting about this, and, and this is part of the synchronicity of why we, you and I have reconnected. Um, is that, and I told you this a little, when we were talking earlier, like, it's so interesting to me that this, this whole idea of questions, like asking questions has been a recurring theme showing up for me as a means to heal for about the last two years. So like, um, I, I've, you know, the, the process of inquiry it showed up spiritually. It's showed up in business because I took John Maxwell's course, um, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. I was part of a mastermind of other leaders in different businesses who were exploring how you can become a powerful leader by asking really pointed questions. So that showed up in business. And then just um, daring, really, Brene Brown also opened this up when she, in her whole Daring Greatly thing about um, if you really want to get to the heart of vulnerability, you'll ask the right questions to yourself, not to other people. You'll get really, really honest with yourself. And then I thought about the 12 steps and how you take that honest, fearless, moral inventory of a brother in recovery from alcoholism. He just did his two-year sobriety, my brother Bryce, kudos to him. But the same thing showed up there. And then when I went on the Magdalene path, I call it the Magdalene path, when I really dove in um, to study her life and what she represented, it made me see Christ in a way of just, he was the master question asker ask her. (laughs) And uh, he taught in questions. So tell us, so in saying that, that you have this whole book on questions and then um, asking different questions can open new worlds within the subconscious mind, which I find absolutely fascinating. So tell us the science of that or, or what you told me earlier about that, which was really cool. And then tell us about your journey with questions and how it led you to write the book and where it's taking you now. Sure. So uh, the, the interesting thing about questions is that 
they, okay, well, let, let me start of why I came with, up with the book and we'll get to that part. Um, and that is when I would ask my clients questions, I watched their eyes uh, move to a certain part above their head to gather information. And I recognize that when you ask questions that your mind goes to a whole different place and than it does with memories. And so I wanted to create a tool for my clients to be able to ask themselves powerful questions that had to do with what's going on in their body. And the cool thing about questions is that questions bypass the ego mind. It's like you coming in the back door and the ego didn't even detect it. So if we come at the ego with information or with answers or with um, uh, outside resources, the ego can filter it. And it has, you know, that little filter that's like yes or no or, or how it's going to feel about um, what's being presented to it. But with the question, it's like the ego, it's invisible to the ego. And the question penetrates the mind. And many times it can interrupt the neural pathways. And the neural pathways have been going continuously in the brain for and, until they get interrupted. So if we're asking a question that interrupts a toxic neural pathway, it's like the question puts that neural pathway on hold for a minute and it kind of suspends it, if you will. And by asking a question, you're inviting the higher, your higher intuition to have a dialogue with you. And that, that's why questions are so powerful. Anyone who is in a pattern of growth is continually asking questions. And so any environment that discourages questions is not about you discovering truth. And because the truth, the truth would never um, discourage or resist asking questions. The truth demands that we ask questions, and that's how we that's how we start following pathways of um, of expanded consciousness and growth is by asking those questions. And so that's that's kind of how I came up with the book is to use what's going on in the body as kind of a map to ask specific questions that are related to your emotions and your beliefs, and to bypass the ego mind interrupt the neural pathways and open up a dialogue between you and your higher self using a question you never thought to ask because uh, you didn't know it was related to what was going on in the body. So that's kind of why I put Mm. the book together is because I was recognizing, you know, the, the elegance of inquiry in the mind. I love that. And I'm really obsessed with the whole concept of soul sovereignty which has been coming through really strong for me as well. And I have seen the link now between inquiry and soul sovereignty because both of them are a process of going within and not relying on external sources to hand deliver information relevant that should be relevant to you, right? Um, I think, yes, I think it's so fascinating that, and I've said this before, like, and, and for those of those people who don't align with Christianity, just bear with me because I talk about Christ a lot in terms of like his process with people and why he was such a master teacher is because he was able to read people and find he probably already had an idea of what was wrong, of course, <laughs> but he he didn't give them the answer straight up. He asked them what they thought. And it gave them the opportunity or the soul invitation to go inside and have that their own experience of discovery. And we are not encouraged to do that at large. We're not encouraged to do that in schools. We are given the textbooks, right? When we're said, these are, this is the science. Yeah. These are the experts. Just trust it. This is the truth. Just trust, take our word for it, right? There's that. And it's really showing up in religion. We can do, we can really get into that uh, as we advance in our discussion, but, but take us through how you even got to the point where you're like, oh my gosh, I need to write a book on it. Cause I know your story a little bit. And I know that you've done a lot of work personally at one-on-one with people in your field. What kind of practitioner, practitioner work did you do? I know you were helping with emotional release, right? You were helping emotional release facilitation. Yes, I in about um, 2006, I started with Rapid Eye Technology, and that kind of led me into emotional freedom technique or the EFT, or some people call it tapping. And so that's 
what I was doing with my clients, just helping them um, have great breakthroughs in their life whenever they were, you know, up against challenges and felt blocks in their life and, and just using my intuitive gifts. But, you know, the mark of a real teacher, a true teacher is someone who wants to encourage you to know yourself and to know how to do it yourself, that you're not dependent on them. And I think that, like you said, Christ would ask questions, not because he wanted people to think how smart he was. He wanted you to know the source of truth. And so at least what is true for you and that that was the pattern um, was by asking questions and going within. And so that that's kind of, um, I just was seeing the power of questions, but when I completed the book, something, something epic happened to me because I, in writing the book, what basically what I did is I would go into the feeling and the emotion and try to match the frequency of somebody who is being challenged with this specific symptom. So if someone had like diabetes and I knew what the links were, um, and I, I found those links with other experts in the field, like Louise Hayes, you can heal your life. And also mm-hmm. Carol Truman's Feelings Buried Alive, Never Die. Those two books kind of um, blend together to let us know what the beliefs and, and the emotions are surrounding the physical symptoms. But the reason I wanted to write the questions is because I wanted to have a tool to be able to really investigate within the mind. And what, so I would go into this um, almost like a channeling, I guess. I would just try to be in the place of somebody who had these symptoms and would formulate the questions that would help um, realign them with their source and with their, with um, that inner power. And what I realized that so many of the symptoms were linked to uh, contempt against the self. Mm. And that, that was so powerful for me. And, and so much of it was so much fear of the unknown and also uh, so much uh, feeling insufficient and unworthy. And so that's when I started asking even more powerful questions. I'm like, what is the source of self-contempt? What is the source of this feeling insufficient? What is the source of me constantly questioning my worth and what I deserve or what I can have and all the requirements of that? And what really was profound for me and actually life-changing, earth-shattering, absolutely epic transformation. I, I didn't know that that one question was going to shift my life in, in a whole way that I wouldn't recognize it once I received the answer. And that was a lot of my religious beliefs were feeding me, um, probably unintentionally, <laughs> but it was feeding me the idea that I was insufficient that I was not worthy and that there was something I had to do to qualify to connect to God and that I felt um, this general contempt against myself because I was just constantly um, feeling not good enough. Right. And like, I just couldn't do it no matter how hard I tried. Mm. It's such a, it's such a, it's such a really, really difficult hamster wheel to run around and around and around on. Um, it's, it's actually a, kind of about going unconscious, wouldn't you say, until you can ask that question, that, which takes a lot of courage, honestly, to ask, even ask that. Yes. <laughs> because it's not a, it takes courage. <laughs> it takes that courage and it takes a lot of vulnerability, but you have to be willing to brave the answer. When I, when I knew what the, when I had heard that answer, I doubted it and doubted it, but Um, And it took so much courage for me to say, okay, there are some questions I need to ask about, you know, the traditions that I was raised in, that if I get answers that I'm really uncomfortable with, am I going to live my life congruent with that? And the thing is, is everything we believe and every emotion that we are, um, that we are engaging with within our body, it has a frequency to it. And if that belief is misaligned with the truth of who you are and you're encoding yourself yourself with um, a contaminated virus, like a, a belief that is so incongruent, that belief and that frequency continually um, going through your body is informing your body 
until it informs a disease or dysfunction. Yeah. And And so I think, yeah, just knowing that that is more than a spiritual process, it's actually a biochemical process that that self-contempt, um, and you talked about this on another interview I heard you on, that your cells actually start fighting against each other. So what we think is just kind of a like nice little phrase people use of self-sabotage, it's actually biochemically, anatomically, and physiologically accurate to say that because you're at war with yourself biochemically. And What you're talking about, the way that I interpret that is the dissonance that happens is um, it's kind of like taking two keys on the piano that really clash and trying to make music out of it. It in the body, it if 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 a belief that you carry that's been handed to you or that's been told to you and you accept it as truth and it's actually not true for you, that discordant energy in the body can literally create disease. And I've seen it. I've seen it. And I know you have too. So you are feeling that. So, so after you finish your book, you, you're like, holy crap, like everything I just wrote about, (laughs) can I go revisit that for myself? Right. It's kind of what happened. Well, yeah, it was it was kind of like a, a just a smack upside the head, realizing that with this whole 500 pages of questions that I had just formulated, the questions that were now coming to my mind were terrifying me. And, but I had to ask them in the form of a question. Here I had you know been teaching <laughs> the powerful questions, and that was coming up with questions that I was afraid to ask myself because I knew that pathway to truth. And I was kind of afraid that if I actually asked those questions, where would my life lead? Would it unfold? Would it unravel? And I will have to be honest, it it just about undid me when I started to challenge um, some of the things that I was uh, brought up to believe. And it has created um, a lot of disconnection and a lot, a lot of upheaval, but you know, what is not disconnected anymore is me. And what is not, uh, com- communicating these false messages to my body in that dissonance, um, it, it was me communicating and listening and connecting with myself. And I didn't realize how many of it's like, I kind of describe it that there's like these tentacles, these power cords that are coming out of my body and they were all plugged into my religion. And if I let the religion go, then I would have no power. I would have no validation. I would have no place to express myself. I would have no place to receive reward and progress and be noticed and be relevant to my community. And it, it literally, it would feel like I would unplug from the power source. But when I gave myself permission to pull away from the religion and those cords will kind of flail around, they're kind of panically panicking, looking for a foundation, looking somewhere to anchor to. And what I realized and what you were talking about with becoming the sovereign authority of your life is that those cords needed to be drawn inward. And so that I could become my own power source and that I could connect directly to the divine and be instructed and and to um, be able to have that validation from within, to belong within, to be able to live in harmony with what I felt was love formulating in my body. I don't know how to explain it. Love is very, very broad. But it, it was just being a higher sense of knowingness and trusting myself to, to know that I could connect directly with that source and f- having feelings that I was more than sufficient, that I brought my worth with me, that there was nothing that I needed to prove and that I stopped having contempt against myself and my inner dialogue changed. I mean, my inner dialogue was toxic. If I was married to myself, I would have divorced myself a long time ago. <laughs> and so that inner, yeah. that inner critic had been silenced and soothed and comforted. And you probably know this from the book, Power Versus Force, if you're familiar with that book. It's kind of a classic in the field. I can't remember the PhD man who who wrote it, but he did all of these calibrations where they were actually able to scientifically measure the strength 
of certain emotional states. And the lowest, vib- well, the highest vibration was like gratitude. Um, it's, it's right up there with like, you know, and, and it's actually interesting that it's higher than love, which I was like, well, what does that mean? But I think they were talking about relationship love versus the actual power of love. But anyway, gratitude was like the top. Yeah. And then the very, very, very bottom was shame. And it was even, it was even lower than hate. And um, if you think about it, that's what's happening in the body. And one of my, when we're, when we're shaming ourselves, right, that whole all chemical process is literally being circulated through our system. Um, the lowest vibrational matter, the lowest vibrational exchange is happening within the mind body and in the cells of the organic physical body when we shame ourselves. And I have, I have been really astutely aware for many, many years of not only my own religion of origin, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you and I share that same religion of origin, of how shame can be perpetuated through things like teaching girls modesty or teaching about chastity or different laws and covenants, right? That that uh, are supposed to help develop our morality, our, our moral code, our moral compass, and how it's such a fine line to teach that when it could easily switch to shame. So I've been astutely aware of that. But even deeper... Um, I I started to notice and be really, really hypersensitive, I guess about 10 years ago to the feeling I had, especially as I sat in women's meetings at church. Um, And I'm talking about on Sunday because sometimes outside of Sunday, it's different. But the Sunday meeting of of Release Society, where all the women are gathered together in one meeting to discourse principles of the gospel and different things, it was less about what was being taught and more about what I was experiencing with the group dynamic, um, there was definitely a shroud of shame almost every single Sunday that I was trying to parse out. Is this just me? Because I feel so unworthy all the time and I'm not doing well enough or is everyone feeling this way? So for many years, I just kind of kept it to myself and couched it or journaled it. Until I realized that it was not just me (laughs) and that we were there to lift each other. And there's a saying like strengthen the feeble knees, lift the hands, hang hang down, that kind of thing, you know, embrace each other in that way. And and it it was just hard to do in that dynamic. And I, and I've asked why, why, and it might be very similar to your journey. It's just, it's just how how do you, in a system, this is why soul sovereignty becomes so pivotal. Because if you really believe that you stand in a holy place, it's not about where you are. Being steadfast and immovable is about wherever you go is a whole, is holy ground because you're with other humans and that you can maintain your sense of self in connection with the divine no matter where you are. And I had a hard time doing that of all places at church. So I had to climb into that and go, I think what's getting muddied here is I can't separate my soul sovereignty from the organization. I can't because they, there was some attachment to them having ownership of, of my soul that way, because there were certain expectations in order for me to have, like you said, the worthiness or, the instant connection to the divine had to be earned. It, it couldn't just be there. It couldn't just manifest or arrive unless certain criteria were in place. And until I realized that that's what I was feeling, that there's these women who are just hungering, thirsting, trying, exhausted, burned out, so loving, so wise, but not honored for that. There's always something more. There's always something they're doing wrong, or there's always something they're not doing enough of. And that really bothered me as a sensitive soul. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty empathic. Like I, I pick up the energy of whoever I'm with, honestly, like I have to really set boundaries. Um, but that was kind of the doorway for me to go, you know, I have to find out my own truth. I have to find out 
why this is this shame thing is really running amok in me. It's very similar to what you're saying in terms of the self-contempt, why this is there, why every human feels it. I know they do, but why, when we're supposed to be in a culture of spiritual enlightenment or um, the advancement of our own wisdom and our right. own spiritual path. Why and why does that even feel? Why do we even feel worse about ourselves sometimes when we're in church? <laughs> why is that? I'm just asking you. Like okay. I, I have my own ideas, but so <laughs> so I will. I'd love to answer. I love your questions, by the way. So. What I've learned is that we, as you know, divine beings, as cellular beings, we have one objective, and that is to grow, grow, grow. In fact, it's not enough to wake up. You've got to grow up. You've got to clean up, and you've got to show up. And what happened for me as I was writing this book, and I came to these realizations, um, and if we go back a little bit to David, it's David Hawkins who wrote um, The Power Versus Force. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David Hawkins. It's a, yeah, it's a beautiful book. And, and if you have love and gratitude at the very top of the scale and you have shame at the bottom of the scale, what happens is when you're in a religious paradigm that says that we're teaching each other how to love or become, or become like the master who is, who is love itself, but yet also woven in the doctrines are, are doctrines of shame. So you have this dichotomy here where you have the, the polarity becomes so intense. And when the polarity, polarity on both ends is being pulled, what we get is stagnation. What we get is like, it's a literal polarization that denies growth. And so that is what we're feeling is, a, is a, this lack of growth. And so if we are, if our goal is to move in this place of, of being holy and standing on holy ground, to me, what that means is that we are learning to actualize our sacred self and to recognize our sacred self as it is and trying to clean up the things that are not in alignment with our sacred self and to know our sacred self. And what happens is when the religion is so tightly woven into your identity, you don't know who you would be without the religion. When people attack the religion, it feels like they're attacking you. Yeah, it feels like I don't know who I would be without this church. And that means that you have been completely plugged into a church and a doctrine and not into source. So it is not, you know. Yeah, I just want to say that to speak to that just a little bit, because, yeah, I mean, especially if it's your culture and your heritage, because it then becomes more than a religion. It becomes, as you say, a source of identity, almost a family. Um, And so. It's kind of like, again, Christ teaching, you know, at some point that you got to leave your family, got to leave your, what you know, and take up your cross and follow me, um, which is a very sacred personal process. And what would you say, let me just ask you this right here. When you talked about the polarization that can happen, I totally, I totally see the stagnation, by the way, I totally see people who are just doubling down and like super active doing everything and they are miserable and exhausted. But I've also seen people who find a measure, a lot of fulfillment and a lot of happiness around that community dynamic. Like, like they really thrive in it. Um, I also see that if you, so I see both, I guess is what I'm seeing. So you and I both follow Richard Rohr in the first and second half of life and the falling upward mentality where, and I talk a lot about this. I had a whole podcast on it where I talked about it, but basically there's a ceiling you reach where you, you have to step out of the community to follow Christ. And I know that seems anti, <laughs> you know, it's, it's antithetical to a lot of the doctrinal um, ideologies that we're presented with because the, the stay with the group is the safety. That's what gets perpetuated. Stay with the group because the, the underlying fear is you will be deceived. And I would venture to say that a lot of people maybe that are even listening to this right now who might really be religious and active in religion might be think that you and I are deceived. So what would you say to that? Um, I have my own way to speak to that. Um, how do you know when you're being deceived versus, I mean, you kind of already talked about it, but how do you know when you're like 
off track or being deceived or uh, not on the path of light or not connected to God? How do you, what is your gauge for knowing that versus, Hey, I just want to do what I want to do. You know, like, how do you know the difference? Sure. Um, So the interesting thing is growth happens in conflict and our ego mind does not want conflict. (laughs) So those things that, that might, you know, if we start to believe them or consider them that, that we know that if we're going to move in that direction are going to create conflict, the ego doesn't even want to go there. And so sometimes it's, um, it gets scary to ask those questions, (laughs) but what, what happens is when, When there is fear, I'm going to give you the formula of controlling the masses. There has to be fear and there has to be an enemy. And then there has to be um, a solution, a solution nobody else has, a solution you can't get anywhere else. And what that, what that creates is manipulation and inner manipulation and a disconnect from your inner self. And so what I understand now about my Christ path is that I'm developing the Christ within, the holiest parts of me. And so how I can recognize if I'm going to be deceived or whether I'm following something that's more true and more enlightened and more expansive is, does it make me grow? And so when I started to ask questions about, you know, my faith and my religion and the, the answers were starting to terrify me, I had to look at them and say, but wait, does it, does it make me grow? Well, does it make me grow to disappoint my family? Does it make me grow to actually um, become irrelevant in my community? <laughs> does it, does, is it going to make me grow? And it's like, well, yeah, it does. And it's painful. And, and I don't know that I even want it, but the, the outcome is more self-sovereignty, more mm-hmm. knowing who I am. And it's almost like I had built this tapestry and very tightly woven in it was this thread of my religion. And I was afraid that if I pulled that thread and kept pulling it and pulling it, that I would disappear. But the thread of religion is not the f- what fabric that I was made out of. The fabric that I was made out of is holy and divine. And so as I began to pull that, that thread of religion, what was uh, discovered underneath after I had addressed all of the questions and, and know who I am underneath, it, it was me. It was, it was the me, the, the unfiltered me, the unlimited um, me. And, and it was terrifying, literally terrifying. It put me in a state of depression for quite a while. And I had all of these amazing gifts and talents and skills that I had learned about emotional wellness. And I'd written a book and all this. And here I find myself in, the, in depression because I, I had to unplug from everything that was giving me validation at that point. And I, I wasn't quite sure how to plug into the real source. Yeah. It's and like the a, ma- it was a scary journey. You have to unplug from the matrix to find yourself. And this is really what it means. Yeah. And it's and terrifying. It is. So I, I was pretty open about this on um, episode 34 when I talked about my Mary Magdalene journey or, and it really wasn't even about Mary Magdalene. It was about what is that pointing me to? What is the uh, the draw or the calling I feel to go on these pilgrimages and to explore this? And it was just like, I was just wanting self-sovereignty, but I had no idea that that's what I was wanting because I didn't even think that that would, I thought it would be contradictory to what the true path of Christ is. I really believed that. I felt like I had to give my all over to the religion, to the church, to the kingdom, if you will, of God on the earth to, in order to be accepted or to um, get my true marching orders from God to fulfill my actual mission in life. And so I felt like I would be turning my back on God himself by denying that someone else has the authority or the keys over my salvation, which as I look at it now, I'm like, I can see how there would be safety there. I could see how I was held to that. And now I can also see that I honor people who are still in that space because it's it, it can be a very beautiful, um, humble, benevolent space 
but I can also see again, how that ceiling gets put on your advancement and growth. And that's what you're saying. You're saying, Hey, you know, um, if, if institutions like these religions set themselves up as the solution provider and, and I, and I mean a capital T the solution provider that takes away my yes. ability to find my own solutions for my own way and way capital W because when Christ said, I am the way, the truth and the life um, and no man come to the father, but by me, it, he meant, he meant him, not, not a, a, an organization. So as I have been doing yeah. my own deconstructing, I completely relate to that grief that you're referencing where everything that you teach <laughs> Everything that you're, because uh, yeah, I'm seeing myself in your story. Like, I've been teaching emotional healing, I've been teaching spirituality, I've been teaching all of these things for so many years. But until I asked the soul deep questions of what if this isn't what I thought it was? What if this is actually holding me back? What if this is actually only supposed to have only supposed to form a foundation for me to receive something different or something more or something um, that's more tailored to my own life path? When I when I dared to ask those things, I can't tell you what showed up for me to see distortion after distortion after distortion after distortion that I had believed was true. Um, Mm -hmm. one example, I'm just going to give one example. So, um, I'm about to interview Warren Jeff's 65th wife on my podcast. And, um, some of you may, some of you listeners may know about her, Brielle. Um, and we were connected through a mutual friend, but, um, you know, of course she, Warren Jeff's really took polygamy to a whole other dark dimension (laughs) in our current modern world, but, and his, his father and grandfather and so forth. But when I remember when I was, um, oh gosh, I probably was about nine years old. If I have to, I have to guess. And I learned about the practice of polygamy and as a nine year old, and this is no exaggeration. I felt like someone kicked me in the stomach energetically. It literally reeled me back and I never recovered from it. And the reason I, the reason I say that is because my body knew, my soul knew that that was not a practice of God. And I can unequivocally say with all the fortitude of my soul, it never was. That is my experience and that's what lives in my soul. And so knowing that the church was attached to that history, you know, um, the founding the founding prophet of, of the Mormon religion, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, both having multiple, multiple, multiple tens of wives and many of them decades younger than they were. Um, and some of them even being married to other men, but which I didn't find out till later in life. But I'm just saying that because as a nine-year-old, I knew, I knew, but I acquiesced to over the years, even having served a mission and having people spin it like, oh, there weren't enough men. Oh, this, oh, that, oh, it was just temporary. Oh, this, oh, Abraham practiced it. Oh, this, oh, that. No matter how anyone spun it, It never rested in my soul. And I'm talking sob sessions with God over the years, many, many decades running. So I had to wrestle with that doctrine. And um, I'm still waiting for the church to rescind it. (laughs) Um, But they don't have to rescind it. The reason I'm bringing this up is like, that's my truth that lives in my soul. That's wrong to me. That's denigrating women, families, and the sanctity of marriage and the self sovereignty of women. And it's continuing to play out in these other fundamentalist sects that exist. So the fruits of that still play out in a dark way. But I bring that up because... I th- I have talked about this in other episodes. I see truth and and religious teachings of all all sorts, like Hinduism, Buddhism, Christian, and you could even put Mormonism in there and just put it all in one big buffet. I look at it as I need the freedom to be able to take pieces that resonate 
and put it into my puzzle that I'm putting together as my creed for life and what resonates in my heart. I don't want to have to be be beholden to um, a set established um, set of doctrines that I, it's all or nothing, right? Like it's either you believe all of it or none of it. That, that is not the way of the soul. And that is not the, what Christ was teaching either. So I just wanted to intersect that. I finally told, I finally said to myself, maybe two years ago, I'm like, okay, I knew as a nine-year-old that this wasn't resonating. I knew something wasn't right and I didn't honor it. And it's caused a lot of wrestling and anguish. And so when I, when I actually said to myself, what if it's not of God? <laughs> like, what if, what if it never was? What if it's just the foibles of a man who took it to a level that it was never supposed to go to? When I did that, and it changed the story for me, and it allowed me to accept what I want to accept and, not ha- and what resonates um, in the heart of my soul, in the seat of my soul, with a connection to a creator who I believe um, would never have had that be the program I was to ascribe to in the eternities or even here on earth. Um, when I opened that up and claimed that for myself, it opened up another conversation in me of, well, what else? What else has been presented to me that's not landing right? What else, what else is perpetuating fear like you talked about? Um, so long rant there, but I just had to talk about the polygamy thing because that's something that I, mm-hmm. um, is re- I'm really passionate about that particular part of the history of and the doctrine that I was born into that I think has really affected the psyche of the women within the LDS faith. Yeah, I, I agree. I would like to, to talk a little bit about that, that moment when we challenge um, what we've been taught. I mean, we, we are educated enough to believe what we are taught, but we're rarely educated enough to challenge what it is we we've been taught and that what I realized is I as I was moving into the space of transitioning away from what I had been taught I recognized that I was very I was conditioned and programmed to be very dedicated and very devoted to something that I knew very little about and that's when my my studies began to be unbiased they began I wanted to know the truth and I began to to read books and to um, study the the life of Christ and whether it aligned with what I had been taught and I and I studied Christ outside of the the theology that was given to me and so in that space I recognized that religion were was manufactured I um, mean it was factored by men <laughs> it was manufactured attempts to understand the mystery of our own existence, but yet it was bent to those people, the prophets or whoever was delivering it and whoever was agreeing to these stories, it was bent to their benefit. And we had created God in our image rather than trying to understand this mysterious God that is that is freely flowing through us and is the intelligent and sacred part of us. And so that that's kind of where I felt my growth happened is, is when I realized that I had been given permission to challenge whatever it was that I had been believing. <laughs> have it handed to you. Um, I think we all have to come to a reckoning at some point. If we're on a very devoted spiritual path, there is a point of reckoning where we must ask those really hard questions and have the courage to explore you know, what has been delivered to us versus what we know. And I liked what, how you phrase that. We're conditioned to be devoted to something we know very little about. That's called uninformed consent. Um, yes. And, and, and it can hold the soul hostage. It could also be a vehicle for empowerment. And that's what religion should be. It should be a vehicle for empowerment. It's only the vehicle. It's not the end. It's just the means to bring you through to develop a set of, um, well, if it's healthy, it should be able to take you through that first half of life with a strong sense of who you are. What I think is happening, as you say, is people are confused about that, especially, I will say this, the feminine. 
we don't know. We keep hearing about divine parents. We get dropped a line or two about a heavenly mother. But beyond that, what is the identity of that? It's not clear. It's an unclear mystery. And it should be a mystery, probably. However, um, we, when I talk about the uh, Latter-day Saint woman having this hovering thing in her psyche, and Carolyn Pearson talks a lot about this in The Ghost of Eternal Polygamy. She's one of my heroines, actually, who kind of woke me up to, it's okay to be mad about this. <laughs> it's okay to be a spiritual person and be active in this religion and actually be mad about this. Um, but yes. the psyche, what happens, I mean, Carl Jung would have a field day with this. So would um, Freud. What happens to the psyche when there's not clarity when there's, when there's a devoted practice or an allegiance, if you will, to a system and a hierarchy, when you don't actually know what you're committing to because there's an unclear destination point. And um, especially for women, we don't have visible authority figures that have some kind of power in decision-making. Um, it's always deferred to the priesthood authority, which I honor and respect, however, I have always held to the belief that women should be part of the highest realms in the Holy of Holies. They should be in all the meetings. They should be part of the fasting and praying process. Their wisdom should be, um, they should be counseling together and their wisdom should be honored the way they look at life, the way that they, um, they actually, um, yeah. So anyway, that I think for me, my, I was having a damaged view of what it means to be a woman because I was only getting half of the story about spiritual authority and what that means for the spiritual gift expression of women. And, and even from an eternal destiny standpoint, not just right here and now, um, women have typically taken on auxiliary or support roles. And so, um, that doesn't mean motherhood isn't powerful and amazing and incredible. Um, but that is a less visible, less active role in policy making. And um, you could even say authority in the highest rungs of the church. And it is affecting, definitely affecting the psyche of the developing woman and the millennials, I would say in particular, who are like, we don't want hierarchy. Jenna Reese talked a lot about this, um, wrote about this. We don't want hierarchy. We want relationship. <laughs> we want to be part of it. We want to have a voice. So, yeah. I love that. I, I know there, there came a time in my, as well, I call it rebirthing. It's like we're, we're giving birth to ourselves this time instead of um, being born into the world and being taught about the world, we're rebirthing ourselves by understanding our identity and that, that there's a point in time that we must be willing to disappoint and hurt and confuse all the people that we love dear, dearest in order to stop betraying ourselves. And we have to trust that knowing ourselves is worth it. And when we no longer need others to think fondly of us, we begin collecting the parts of our identity that we have given away to those that we have given our authority away to. Mm. And so I, I just wanted to, to share that part in rebirthing is that um, is letting go of needing others to accept this journey that you're on, that this is, this is you. Um, and sometimes it feels like you're, you're breaking away from everything you, you know, and they call this the dark night of a soul for a reason. I know when, when I uh, relieved myself, when I first had the thought, like you said, that maybe everything I've taught, maybe it isn't true. And I was like, and if it isn't true, then what? And then I thought, I had a surge of such beautiful energy and peacefulness and just, I felt so radiant and relieved and I was feeling energetic. But what I didn't realize was that now I, that, that the coming across the monster of exiting the institution was going to bring me down to the lowest parts of me because I realized how connected I was to needing that outside validation. And that's when that depression hits and you enter into that dark night of the soul 
and you you start to wonder, you know, who am I without all of these things that I've been feeding off of and that have been giving me some source of false power and and relevance in the world? And it, it can get dark and discouraging, but trust that your inner beauty is going to come through that when you plug in to what feels right for you, what feels growing for you, what feels expansive and beautiful and delicious, hold on to all that. The fruits, all the fruits of the spirit, right? Those are all the fruits of the spirit. It's what yes. religion is supposed to bring to us. It's what the organization is supposed to be a guide for, not a control of. Yes. Yes. I love this everything. supposed to lead us there and then we are supposed to walk. Yeah. I love everything um, that I was born into and the the places it took me and the people and the wonderful community and the memories. And I haven't completely said, oh, that's not for me, right? I'm still in a space of um, putting together what feels like my buffet, <laughs> my spiritual buffet. I, if you go to my mm-hmm. my blog or my podcast page, you'll see, like I call myself, I'm something of a Christian mystic yogi, <laughs> Buddhist, whatever. Because um, <laughs> what I'll tell you what I love about Buddhism and mysticism. So mysticism, and you probably know this, Wendy, it's just, it's just a, it's actually a, it's, it's a term that has Christian origins. It's all about... Um, having direct experience with the beloved or the divine. That's all mysticism is. It's not like some magic supernatural voodoo thing. Yes. Buddhism teaches the same thing. Yes. Buddhism is about directing the soul inward. It's about going and having mindfulness and having an awareness and being in the present moment. That is not something that is being taught in many Christian religions. And that's why I was drawn to learn those things because I wanted to have the experience of having a direct pipeline or connect, even though we're told that we have that, we're told we're daughters of it, or we're sons of it, or we could be worthy to always have it. If we were lucky, if we did the right things, what I love about my new paradigm of that is that, yes, all of that is true. However, I don't, I don't need, I can, I can instantly access it through breath. I don't need to go through a checklist yes. or a questionnaire by an authority to get me to the space where I might be qualified. I can instantly access that through breath. Yeah. And honestly, what broke that open for me was taking yes. a 200 hour teacher training for yoga with my daughter. Um, I was like, why did I not learn this? That breath is so, <laughs> um, but it, it was like, that's what I was feeling when I, that's the, that's the um, dissonance that I was feeling when I would be at church with these groups of women is that they were disconnecting from their bodies because they felt unworthy. And so they were just trying so hard to get it. Like, what is it going to take for me to feel that connection to God? What more do I have to do? Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to clear up? What do I need to repent for? What do I need to, you know, what do I need to do that I'm not seeing? How could I be a better mom? How could I be a better wife? How could I be a better community sovereign? How could I fulfill my calling? And it was completely missing this whole soul-based, hey, do nothing. Sit with yourself. Breathe. And, and you're there. You could be there. Everything you're striving for is already there. What you're seeking is there. And, and that's the whole, my whole passion with the kingdom or the queendom within is the instant access. Um, I actually had this woman from Ireland on one of my podcasts, Ada Marcarine, uh, recently. She was, I think, part, part four or something in the Mary Magdalene series. And she was raised Catholic in um, Ireland because that's, of course, the prevailing religion there at the time. She said it's completely dis- just completely coming apart. The Catholic- people are li- re- leaving all religion in Ireland, pretty much all over Europe, too, um, because they have been longing to feel worthy. And so they they weren't feeling it at church and they weren't feeling it this and that. So they there's just been this this resurgence of like meditation and yoga and all these practices that bring you into the body so that you can have some sort of connection. And that is why people are, that is what people are trying to get when they go to church. It's what people are trying to achieve through prayer. 
um, fasting and temple worship and going into synagogues and chants and mantras. Everyone is searching and hungering to feel this peace and this like, oh, everything's going to be okay. You're okay. You're more than okay. We don't know how to access that. And religions are doing really not a great job of it because there's always something to feel guilty about. <laughs> more guilt and less love. Yeah, I was, I was going to... I was going to say my, my church experience, I was being taught how to qualify to have that spirit and to qualify to have that, that, um, connection to God. And nobody was teaching me just how to tune in. I had to learn that from an, an outside source. And I wish that I had been taught how to tune in. And I, I recognized that in the interviews, my worthiness interviews, as, as a, a youth, I went in for worthiness interviews every six months. And as an adult, I went in yearly. And then it was every uh, two years. I went into the, for these 12 questions. And these questions, you know, had to do with, am I paying tithing? Am I attending my meetings? Am I agreeing or am I associating with anybody who doesn't agree with our teachings? Am, am I, you know, fulfilling my callings? Am I wearing the right underwear? I mean, they, they had all of these things that were to identify um, my worth. But what they never asked me was, do you feel loved? Mm. Are you feeling, um, gr are you growing do are you, you taking connected to God? Are you taking of the fruit fruit of the tree? Are you feeling? Yeah, are you feeling yes. the love of God? Are you feeling peaceful? Do you feel a connection to the yeah. to Heavenly Father? Do you feel a connection to Christ? That never comes up. That doesn't come up in the question. Yeah, no, I I was being my worth was being associated with how well I could conform to the institution. It was not being identified as, at, am I feeling that love? And what I realized is that there is no, there is no place that I don't belong. And there, there is no temple, a holy temple that I'm not worthy of entering into. That, the, it, that this was a space that had rules and, and in their game, we needed to obey those rules. But I was never being asked the, the deep questions of, you know, are, are you feeling loved? Are you feeling connected and tuned in? And if not, how can I help you get there? That was not mm. being, I was not having that experience at all. Yeah, what if the rhetoric and the narrative um, in, in some of these larger groups and could be turned to our first goal is to help you feel whole. And because you already are, guess what? Here's a new paradigm. You already are that. You already are everything that you hope that you could become. You already are. You just have to let it unfold. You just have to allow it to come out. You just have to be affirmed of your worth over and over and over. Because what, ha what happens to the psyche when you're in a high demand religion or organization or something that requires a lot of you is you lose a sense of, of your identity. And, and, and like you, we started the conversation like this, like you lose, you can only do the group think. You can only be part of the culture. You can only identify yourself within the con confines of the community. It's really hard to separate your life force, your very divine life force from that. And you, you get into a conformity. Yes, because conformity, group think, stay in the mainstream. That gets reinforced over and over and over. This is your culture now. This is, this is you know, who you are, is with us, part of us. Um, so, yeah. Yes. And the, and the church becomes your, it's like the, the church becomes your source instead of that holy divine source. And the illusion is, is that we're separate. And anything that feeds that illusion is contrary to us connecting with that source. And so I just, so many teachings were separating me from God rather than connecting me with God. What would you say to someone who says, okay, Wendy and Sheree, <laughs> I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to somebody who's listening, probably, um, probably thinking, well, if you were doing it the right way, you wouldn't feel this way. You would be getting a lot of revelation and you wouldn't feel that the church is limiting you. You would feel like it's empowering you. So it must be you. What would you say to that? 
Because I, honestly, I would have been the, I would, the listener two years ago. I would have been in the listener on this conversation, the fly on the wall going, oh, those two women, they just don't get it. They don't see what this the right way. It's them. Something's wrong with them. I'm gonna let so you speak I, to that. I, and here's the thing. I, I totally, <laughs> and I understand that. And I would be right there too. I would be saying, no, they're, they're deceived. They don't understand or they're, you know, they're not living it right. Okay. I don't know what God expected me, how to live it right. But I did everything because I wanted that connection so bad. I was living in a high level of obedience. I was trying everything in my power to qualify and to, to get to that place. But I don't, I don't know the knowing that I have now, I was just following what was going on in my heart. I was terrified. I was literally terrified and I did lose just about everything in my life. But here's the thing, where I am today and the joy that I feel, the love that comes effortless for me, the love that that I have for other people, the way that I see things, the expansion and the growth that I have experienced after I transitioned away and became the sovereign authority in my own life. I know I could not experience that within that paradigm. And the difference is so stark. And the contrast is so palatable that when I walk, like you, when I walk into a room, I went into um, church just a couple of weeks ago because I have a daughter who's still active and I was visiting and I was being respectful and joining their family and what they love and is important to them. But when I walk into a room of of sisters and I can cut the shame with a knife, shame that I didn't even know I was swimming in when I was in there, that I know that I'm on the right path. And I know that I have this, this, um, this connection that I couldn't find in there. I could not feel and find that solid connection because it was always being filtered through doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, um, there I'm still constructing where I'm at, Um, but it's undeniably rich in the the shame, as you mentioned, that has what has been bothering me. It's why I started. um, It's why I travel. Um, I had to get out of the cultural bubble and see a lot of cultures, faces, peoples, customs, and um, just to see the goodness of humanity that it didn't make any sense to me yes. as I'm thinking critically, right? Cause we're discouraged from independent critical thinking. It's looked down upon, it's frowned upon as intellectualism, but this is my brain. This is where my brain goes. I, I, I have a mind for a reason. One of the things that I really always struggled with, even as a young girl, again, was why would God hide, um, his highest truth and his, um, why would he, first of all, have like a real elite group of people that are better than everyone, right? Um, we could do a whole thing on that. Why would God do that, that kind of stratification, really? A. B, why would only 0. 0.0 something 2% of the population be privy to that? Why would the other 99.98% of the population not have access to potentially what's supposed to be the plan of happiness. And why are the people not happy that are the 0.02%? So for me, it was critically well, and that's thinking key. through that, where not only was I feeling the distance, but I was also thinking about it going, this isn't lining up in my being. Well, and I would have to say, I, I like the A that, you know, it really is that this little tiny 0.01% of the population, really the only ones that understand it. And uh, B, what was your B? It was, um, it was like, how come so many have, don't have access to it? Yeah. Why would, why would not everyone have access? And why is it called the plan of happiness when, on, when those 0.02% of people really aren't that happy? Exactly. That's, that was the C part for me. And why aren't people flooding in? Why aren't they seeing it as, oh my goodness, finally, this is the pathway to happiness. And why aren't people happy? I mean, in the, 
that that's what was flooring me as like I'm living this the very best I know how and I'm so I'm so empty inside and I, I don't feel like I'm growing and I feel so discouraged and I and I look around in in my circles my religious circles and going these people are not happy and this is supposed to be the plan of happiness the only the best plan out there why aren't people flooding to it because they recognize it as a happy plan and why why if it is the plan of happiness are we all so sad and discouraged and distraught yeah and overwhelmed well <laughs> overwhelmed yeah that is so prevalent there's there's a high level of antidepressant usage lots of neuroticism lots of scrupulosity you know, OCD type, try to be this regimented, perfect being. And I think what's unraveling for people is, hey, I can't do it. I literally can't do it. And there's so much shame in the fact that that realization that you can't be perfect. I know you probably tried, I tried. Um, And in saying that, it's not about letting go of a moral guide or compass or, you know, that it really is true, the scripture, like that you lose, you lose the, when you, when you get to a per certain point on your growth trajectory and you really are seeking after truth because for me it isn't really about religion it's the pursuit of truth so you really are on that focused path and that becomes your vision in your spiritual eye you don't have the disposition to harm people you don't want to go out on and drink and sleep around and you know you don't want to do those things you don't want to harm anyone and I think that's the fear that people have in, in some of the, these higher demand organizations and religions is that, oh my gosh, if you don't stick with us, you are literally going to collapse. You're going to become a drug addict. You're going to um, become immoral. You'd probably be so deceived that you'll start believing everything you hear. Like it's, it's sending a message that you can't trust yourself, that you're not powerful enough as a sovereign soul to really trust yourself. You have to stay lined up with the group. And that's where it became for me, like feisty goddess energy, like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you for your advice. And I'm talking about some of the, the, the priesthood advice I was given at certain junctures in my life where I was given something from God that was true for me, that was either dismissed um, as a, like, it'll make sense someday, or you're going to have to answer for God if you choose this. And one of those was my divorce. Um, that's in the process of being mediated. Um, I went through a whole, when you're talking about the dark night of the soul, it really has been a five-year journey for me of complete and utter undoing what I thought I knew. Um, But it has also been the most um, peaceful suffering. (laughs) That's the best. (laughs) Suffering with peace in the background, knowing that somehow it's going to come together and it finally is morphing into something for me that is quite liberating, very humbling, something I don't want to take for granted. And also something that I would never want to put on someone else and say, you know what, here's what my experience was and you should do this too. The only thing that I really can do in my retreats or in my programs, and I'm sure you feel this way too, Wendy, is direct people to their truth to listen to their soul voice. Yes. <laughs> Talk a little bit yes. about the dragonfly thing because I know you you have some cool symbolism with how that's shown up for you. I believe that things from nature, whether it's animals or insects or even elements can speak to people in different ways. Um, so talk about the dragonfly because I really love that analogy you shared. Wow, I love to share that. I, I wanted to just finish up what you you had mentioned about um, how, for me, I was exhausted trying to find God in my religion. But when you find God, you know, you know, you feel it, and you no longer want to do the things that would disconnect you from that source. And you start the cleaning up part is severing yourself from what is incongruent with your joy and your growth and giving yourself permission to leave and and to cut off that which is no longer giving you life and so that that becomes it's a difficult process it's it's um the hardest work you'll ever do so Mm -hmm. as far as this dragonfly um 
It's interesting about the dragonfly is that the egg is planted in like a river or a lake or a swamp by its mother. And as the egg um, hatches, out comes what's called a dragon nymph. And this is just a little bug that that's very small and he floats around in the river or the pond or the lake and it it feeds off of the the food um and the plankton and other things that are in the water and it learns how to survive in the environment of the water and they don't know like there is a there's a span of time between nymphs that are two months old or nymphs that are up to six years old (laughs) they don't know what it causes that nymph to to latch onto a reed and to, or a stick or something to, to finally just have the instinct to latch on to that reed and to climb itself upward until it reaches a new environment. And that is the environment of air and land. And the, it ha- I imagine it starts sputtering because it's been in water its whole life. But it, as it's, it has a lung capacity to be able to breathe air. And this dragonfly up until that point did not know that it had this hidden ability. Well, when it comes out of the water, it's quite a process for it to climb out of its old suit, its old nymph body. And as it does, it has like a built-in hydraulic system. And this built-in hydraulic system begins pumping out the water. And as it pumps out the water, the drag it's almost like unrolling a sleeping bag. The dragonfly, the beautiful thorax of a dragonfly appears. And it, you know, here this, not only did this nymph not know that it could breathe air, it had no idea what was inside of itself so beautiful. Not only this long, gorgeous thorax that's a bright, brilliant color in comparison to its gray and dungy nymph self, yeah. it also has wings. It has wings. And it begins to fly. And it already has this knowing within it how to, to operate all this. And so water is very symbolic of our emotions. And as we're having this transition, this rebirth, this beginning of second life, it is through our emotions and our ability to process our emotions and own our emotions and and give voice to our emotions at this time that that will be the hydraulic system that will grow us into the thorax and to the wings that are already within, within us. And so sometimes when we begin to birth ourselves, we miss that emotional piece and we swim around and swirl around in, in discouragement and anger and despair and depression and, and because we don't know how to process these emotions. And so we, have, we struggle to give birth to ourselves. There's many stages of this. And a lot of that has to do the shift um, into recognizing your wings has to do with letting go of what the, of the old you and the old stories and not just creating a new chapter, but closing the book and say the end and starting a whole new book. Right. Yeah. I love that. Um, and I hope for those people listening who are part of um, religions that they feel that they are being fed and they feel that they do have the autonomy they need for their station in life right now, please don't see this as an invitation to like exit what's working for you. I think the message Wendy and I are collectively sharing is if you aren't feeling fed, if you're not feeling alive, expansive, honored, validated, then it's time to ask different questions. And we don't, we can't give you those questions, right? Wendy, we can't say, here's what you should ask. Um, I was nope. interviewing. I was interviewing another um, guest uh, a few weeks ago, and we taught. And, and she said one of her prayers that she offers is, "Help me to see the beliefs that aren't serving me, or help me to see the wrong beliefs that I'm believing, the wrong things I'm believing." And I thought that was so powerful because we've been conditioned and programmed to ask the same questions to reinforce the prevailing beliefs. We aren't encouraged to ask the opposite questions of what if, or we aren't, we aren't given the array of, of 
quote unquote, approved of questions as it relates to the doctrines. So, and this is not just true of, you know, Mormonism. This is true of any establishment that has a certain set of standards, rules, commandments, doctrines, and and, um, philosophies. So the larger question, the more expansive question is to ask, to be shown what you personally believe that is, is keeping you from your spiritual growth. What are the things you're believing? And, and you and I both know this, Wendy, is that's what happens with emotional well-being. We're, it's the same thing. We're believing things that have been passed to us as prevailing ideologies that our souls and our bodies are not good with. And it's creating disease. It's creating discordance within the same as tr- could be said of anything. What have our parents taught us that's not resonating? What have our teachers taught us at school? What are they perpetuating in the media? What, is, what are the philosophies that are we've internalized as true because everyone else is accepting them, so they must be? Um, I, you know, one of the things I'm developing on kind of on my own vein of research through the Jungian psychology and archetypal studies is how existing paradigms especially spiritual ones or religious ones are create are literally exacerbating mental illness in certain individuals or groups of people and it's fascinating um Mm -hmm. we all just want that permission don't we we all just want for someone to just you know tap us on the shoulder and go you are fine your question have you seen smallfoot by the way (laughs) I keep bringing this movie up because I think it's amazing. I I have. (laughs) We want to be the small foot, like Yeti guy, right? We want to just be like someone just be like, you know, but here's what I've also learned about the dark night of the soul. You have to give yourself that permission. No one is going to give it to you. Yep. Least of all the people close to you. You have to trust and, and trust that you can make it through and that you will be shown the way. And, and, you know, I think about the dragonfly and I think, you know, if you're, if you're a nymph and you're still in, under the water, you don't look up at the flying dragonfly because you don't even know that dragonfly is, is a replica of you. You don't even recognize the dragonfly as a nymph anymore, but you don't go to the dragonfly and say, well, how do you know that the path that you took is true? Because the evidence is there. Look at my thorax. Look at my wings. Why would I want to be a nymph again? And so it it comes into this place as if you're really living and you're following that path. Yes, you are going to go through discouragement. And a dark night of the soul looks like you are depressed. It looks like you're angry. It looks like you're confused because the truth is you you are. It's hard to climb out of that old shell. But once you're you're flying around and you're so happy in, in your new life and people ask you, how do you know you haven't been deceived? Oh. <laughs> look, look at my wings. You know, I had this experience with a, with a dragonfly um, it, and it was like two months ago, I was in Sedona hiking and I'm just sitting in the creek and this dragonfly just keeps hovering by me. It just goes back and forth and back and forth like it's trying to communicate with me or at least that's what I thought it was doing and so I I just closed my eyes and I put my hands out like I wanted to make a little landing pad for this dragonfly to come and have an encounter with me and I closed my eyes and I just went into this place of creating safety that this dragonfly would want to land right in my hand and I knew what was going to happen and I could feel it and I knew when I opened my eyes it would be right there on the landing on the landing pad and I opened my eyes and it wasn't there. I thought, no, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. And so I closed my eyes and I just kind of sent this little subliminal message to this dragonfly that I really want to experience you. And I hope that you feel safe that I could, you know, be close to you. And as I was having all of these little inner, inner, you know, meditations and communications with this dragonfly, I felt a tickle on my left leg. And so I opened my eyes and looked down and dang it, if I didn't see the most gorgeous, big blue and green dragonfly climbing up my leg. Mm. But my response wasn't, oh, there you are. It was like, (sighs) and I screamed and I flicked that thing away as fast as I could (laughs) because it, it just didn't happen the way that I expected to. It didn't happen the way I thought, thought that I wanted it to. I knew I was going to have that encounter, 
it just didn't happen the way I wanted it to. And so I kind of pushed it away. And I think sometimes we do that as, as we, we think that we know the, the spiritual pattern, but it's far different and it's more complex and dynamic than we realize. And the, the way to get through it is to trust that you will be shown so long as you are continuing to ask the questions you will, re- those things will be revealed. You are opening up a conduit into the divine that wants to inform you, that wants to instruct you, that wants to align with you and help you to bloom into that person that you're meant to be. Isn't that lovely? And I'm just seeing this dragonfly on your leg and you freaking out and it's totally making me laugh, but it is such a, <laughs> <laughs> that that's just a really rich metaphor, right? Like When it shows up and it's not in the form we thought we would, what's our first reaction? Fear. Because it's different. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can make all the difference to just trust and allow instead of going straight to the fear response, which is fight or flight. And most, and I've seen this in many arenas, um, you know, we could continue to talk. You and I have been talking forever. We probably should wrap this up, but... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's just so much, there's just so much, um, movement for me around this topic. Cause I'm so passionate about empowering women and men, the feminine in men, um, and letting that flow and express. And as much as we would like to say the feminine is flowing within religions, it's not, it's really not. Um, no, the, there's, not a a downplay, there's a downplay, there's a downplay patriarchal. Yes, it's very patriarchal. And even though it's, it, it has a form of holiness, I'm not trying to downplay that aspect of the holiness factor also, but it's just missing half the picture. It's missing the other half of the yeah. holiness. And when enough women in a gentle and respectful way say, no, this is who I am. These are my spiritual gifts. No one owns those gifts. No one puts parameters or boxes around them. Um, And I have a right to be seen and heard. And when enough women in their own personality, their own um, voice and their own way own that in their bodies, not by picketing necessarily or, you know, doing lots of, you know, campaigns or this or that or the other, those are powerful and those serve a purpose. But what I'm talking about is organic soul awakening where enough souls go, Hey, I have to do it differently because this is not working for me. I have to do this my way. And one of the things that I think I am so grateful for that church has given me are the main tools and, and what I mean by, no, they're not giving the main tools. They're not giving breath and meditation that those are huge. They're not doing that. What I mean by tools is like, I have an eternal destiny. I have a plan, a mission. There's something for me. There's a gen, there could be a general plan of happiness, but I must be missing the boat because I'm not happy. So what is my personal plan of happiness? And when enough people, and it's going to probably be women, Wendy, don't you think when enough women wake up, and they, because women are the containers of creation and they are the ones who actually embody that soul sovereignty most powerfully when enough women go, this is who I am and this is what I need to feel alive. And they own that and they are a voice for that. That's when we will see the true change happening because it's not going to be a top down change. It's not a top down approach. Change never happens that way. It's always grassroots and it's always bottom up. And when enough voices are saying, we just about had it, (laughs) this is the way, these are our needs. When when enough of that happens, that's when you exact change and reformation. So I'm waiting for that. And I'm, it's exciting time to be on the earth, isn't it? It is. And what I think is when when that reaches critical mass and women are awakening, awakening, uh, there's going to just be a, a point in time where Things are going to shift quickly and drastically. And as I am, you know, kind of coined myself as a second life midwife, I was taught in love my it. religion. Which love, I love, 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 love it. Second... <laughs> <laughs> but I was taught about a second coming. And to me that, that the earth is not going to be the way that we've known it when this second coming comes and we live from this place of authenticity and this place of direct knowing it, and it to me, that is the second coming. That is 
um, the developing the Christ within and recognizing that holy and sacred within and be it to, to me, we live at the precipice where I really think we're going to see some drastic shifts because it is reaching critical mass yeah, and awakening women and helping them to, to connect and have a voice and have impact is my mission. That is me unpacking my thorax and putting my wings on and saying, you be free. You are a dragonfly. You are a dragonfly. <laughs> Yes. And, and, and empowering that, like you always were, you just didn't know it. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to spend 90% of your energy in a, in a mentality of repentance because you're such a sinner. You're you, you're a sovereign divine, directly connected being. And as long as you stay in the energy of shame, you can't expand. You just can't. So it's all about reconnecting to what you already are, which for me, that's a whole paradigm shift right there. What you just said about the second coming. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of layers to that. And I think um, there's power in believing in that there, there is a lot of power in preparing for that. But what I hear you saying, which I align with is that what if you could, and Ada Mark Crane took me through this in our interview too, the one that was raised Irish Catholic, um, that you can have that coming or that reckoning as a second coming for you in your body with the divine, with Christ, however, whatever that looks like. And I don't know what that looks like for each individual, but it has nothing to do with what club you belong to. Um, it has everything to do with the purity of your heart. And, and I've always said this, even when I was really attached to the building of the kingdom of God on earth and Zion and all of that stuff, but I would only hope to be worthy to be part of someday. Um, and people are still teaching this. And I think it's worth noting that Zion can't come, Christ can't come without Zion and Zion can't come be built without individual hearts waking up to who they are. So in that paradigm, I will sign up all day long. It's a, it's an individual purging dark night of the soul, reckoning, reconciliation, rebirth. And, um, For those who have the courage to stand alone, and as Brene Brown says, dare greatly um, to be vulnerable enough to say, hey, I struggle. Hey, I I struggle with this belief system. Hey, I might be on a lone path, but this is what my soul is taking me to. Um, Instead of shaming somebody who's on that, applaud their courage because it is a grief unlike anything I personally have ever experienced in my life, bar none. I've been through deaths and separations and all kinds of losses, but nothing has been as catastrophic as trying to reconstruct my beliefs. I would have to agree with that. And there are people that become suicidal. There are people that that become, they, they latch on to addictions because they don't know how to deal with all the emotional upheaval that's associated with, with that transition. And I would have to agree with you, Sheree. This, this is how I say it, that the second coming comes individually before it will ever happen collectively. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're experiencing is a second coming is emerging and so many of us are are tearing away from this, uh, these doctrines of fear and shame. And it takes tremendous courage, tremendous courage to say, I, I can't live this anymore. And I'm willing to lose everything to know that there's a better way. There's something higher and available. There's, there's just something out there. I know it. I feel it. I'm going to climb up this odd read and see what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. And that is the highest thing that we have been asked to do is to deny everyone and everything and find God. So that is to be applauded, revered and celebrated, not shamed. And so, yes, I just, I did not know it's going to go this deep into the discussion, but I love what's been created and the flow <laughs> that we've had. And it's, it's, it's really, I, I tread um, carefully here because people can make certain assumptions about you based on what club you belong to or what your transition process may or may not be. And I would only say that I know who I am 
I shouldn't say that. I don't completely know who I am, but I feel a measure of allegiance, not only to speak the voice of my own soul as it relates to sovereignty, but to be um, perhaps a voice of affirmation for someone else who is suicidal or who is questioning or who is internalizing it all as that there's something fundamentally wrong with them and it is killing them. It is killing them. So if I can help to alleviate that suffering by directing people to their own soul, not to my teachings, not to what I offer, but to themselves and facilitate that awakening there so that they can find a measure of peace and move forward with their path and their mission, I think that I can't ask for anything more than that. And that's all I would want to do is to wake people up to who they already are. Um, even the byline for my podcast is for women who long to who long to feel, express, and be who they were created to be, and um, it's different for all of us. So, any parting thoughts, Wendy? Any any final nuggets of wisdom that you want to share with our listeners? This has been super. Um, it's probably going to be kind of a, like a cognitive dissonance exercise in mental gymnastics and cognitive dissonance, a mental gymnastics in like um, a good way, not a negative way <laughs> for some people. It might just be an earth earthquaker for some who know me, who may not know exactly where I'm at, um, who see me as a certain, in a certain way of obedience to, you know, the rules um, that have been laid out. So in saying that, what are some final thoughts there that you would have to share with the listeners um, before we close this discussion out? Um, well, I, 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 again, going back to how I was trained and conditioned, and I don't think it was spoken out loud, but in the environment that I was um, being raised in and with my sisters next to me and, and, and you know, us getting together often um, and, you know, being at church together and, to, and doing things together. Um, when I started to have my transition, I had no one to go to. I couldn't go to my mom. I couldn't go to uh, uh, my friends and let them know that I was having these doubts. I couldn't go to, some people can't go to their husbands. I was able to go to my husband at the time, but and I, and I even asked um, my sister, my brother, my mom, they've said, oh, we've always had doubts. And I said, where do you go to when you've had those doubts? Well, I didn't go to anybody. I just figured it out on my own. And to me, um, that that's such a travesty that we don't create a safe place for people to have doubts and a safe place for people to question. And um, my, my encouragement would be, as you're moving through whatever journey you're on, don't feel like you have to be silent because your voice matters. It matters a lot. And you don't have to say it elegantly and you don't have to articulate it perfectly, but you don't have to be silent because I promise you, as you open up and you speak what's true for you at that moment and truth will change as you get older. But as you speak what's true for you at that moment moment, and what's going on for you, trust that there are going to be people that are going to show up in your life who are going to confirm and witness to you that everything is going to be okay and to keep going and to keep following those, those intuitive, that intuitive guidance. And so there's no reason for us to suffer quietly and silently that as we have our voice and we find our voice, even as awkward and weird as it sounds and how controversial it sounds and it, how discordant it sounds, speak your truth and there will be others that will help lift you up and you will be able, if you suffer silently and quietly, the journey is long and it's hard and it's painful. It's hard and painful even when you're being vocal, <laughs> but when we suffer quietly, we can't help each other. We full of women we don't know um, which ones are resonating and having the same experience that you are because there is no safe place to express our doubt and so my encouragement to you is to speak up use your voice be, don't be afraid to doubt and don't be afraid to to voice what doesn't feel right for you and what isn't resonating for you find those friends and those sisters and those wise brothers and and mentors that are there for you that can help you to know that everything's going to be okay. They don't need to tell you where to go. They don't need to tell you what to do next, but they'll lead you inward. 
Beautiful. And I couldn't have said it better myself. The one word that you that you shared that really stood out is trust. And the divine exercise in trust is one of the most difficult things we experience here on the earth is learning how to trust our own voice when it but the way we do that is to learn how to go within and get lined up, feel the force, the peace, and then move. Whatever Whatever we yes. feel compelled to, to do, we do. And the more we honor, listen, honor and listen, honor and listen, and then do it, that's when our confidence grows. That's when it becomes less important what others think and more important what the soul is speaking and what God is speaking. So, oh my gosh, this has been great. And I, I'm i going to have in the show notes where people can find you and I would encourage them to get your book. The Healing Questions Guide. Lots of amazing stuff on the science about uh, the science around like where emotions show up in the body and how you can switch that out and open through questions. So I would just echo what Wendy has shared and I would just encourage all of you to feel confident that where you are is exactly where you need to be. Even if it's in a place of pain, it's always an invitation to go within. It's always an invitation to connect the only thing that's wrong in this world is disconnection. That's it. And so even repentance is about connection, reconnecting back, coming back in. So keep connecting, keep coming back in, um, trust yourself, trust your voice. Love is the answer. And I hope you all have a beautiful week. And thank you again so much, Wendy, for your wisdom today. Oh, thank you. This has been awesome. Thank you. You know, it shouldn't be so exhausting to try and find God. I think all of us forget we have that direct access and that capacity of direct knowing when we ask the right questions and we remain open. You know, just like her analogy of the dragonfly with that built-in hydraulic system through its thorax, everything that we want to come into us as new information and new peace and new life, we have to pump out all that muck, which is all that stuck negative programming and emotion. And some of it is there to serve a temporary purpose Purpose, but then when it isn't serving us anymore, we need to get it out and we need to purge it. And that opens those new neural pathways in order for us to receive more intelligence and more light. So trusting ourselves then becomes the higher intuition and the invitation. Get out of the fear, recognize that most of everything that we are searching for is already inside of us. So again, here is the invitation to you to come to the Stand Speak Shine Retreat, which is embodying your feminine soul. Step into yourself. And that will be October 24th through the 26th in Utah. Go to my website, shereeburton.com. There are some seats left. I get more and more information, you know, that I'm feeling within to cultivate and develop so that I can bring it to you and help to bring you to the next place in your life or to guide you because it's not really me doing it, but to hold the forum and space for you to guide you into coming home and finding your own direct knowing and your own peace and soul sovereignty. Talk to you next week.